Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome back to Entrepreneurship 101. Uh, we have a very brief presentation uh, instead of a video um, now. I'm going to introduce Suresh Madan, the president of TyQuest. Uh, some of you may have heard of TyQuest, the Indus Entrepreneurs, and I'll let Suresh give you more detail. They run an excellent business venture competition. I have participated as a judge. Uh, it's one competition where they really, really work with all entrants uh, as you go through the stages, and I think there's great value in participating if you're ready to get involved in that sort of thing. So, Shurish, could I invite you up here to tell the group a little bit more? Hi, thank you, Tony. And, uh, Hi, entrepreneurs. I'm really privileged uh, uh, to present before you uh, a business plan, business venture competition which we have designed and we have been operating for last many years. Uh, if you have not heard of this competition uh, and you're interested in starting on your own, I, it's a huge opportunity to participate. Uh, Mars has been a huge supporter of the competition over the years, both as a sponsor and Mars provides us a huge number of resources for mentoring as well as judging the competition. The competition is essentially a quest for talent, ideas, and enterprise. We are seeking innovative business ideas to come forward and participate. Uh, we connect them to investors. Uh, we have, uh, I'll be elaborating on some of our success stories in the competition in the past. We are very proud of the successes our entrepreneurs have been able to achieve in terms of raising financing as well as getting an exit. Uh, and the purpose is to uh, improve the probability of your success. That's the main focus of the competition. We started in 2005 initially with about 30 participants, but for last five years, uh, last four years, we have close to about 200 uh, participants, many of them from GTA area, but quite a few from outside of GTA as, as well. Contestants do see value not just in winning, of course, the prize money is very attractive, but do, they do see value in, uh, in getting their uh, project forward. And many times we see contestants come back second time to participate in the competition. I'll elaborate a little bit more on who the contestants are. But some of the key differentiators of our competition versus so many business plan competitions you may have heard of is the connection with mentoring. Uh, through the help of Mars, as well as uh, a charter member base of Thai Toronto, as well as outside of uh, uh, Thai within the, its global network, we are able to find a mentor in almost every industry. And we connect each and every entrepreneur who is participating in the competition with a mentor. We have 67 mentors located in GTA. These are all successful entrepreneurs and other business leaders. Uh, we also have a database of about 1,200 plus mentors all across the globe. They're located in 56 different cities. We're able to arrange video conferencing, uh, uh, email contacts, and telephone calls for you. Uh, they can answer specific questions uh, relating to the competition. As you will see, the number of stages in the competition, and we advise each of the participants to seek help from mentors to progress their competition forward. Second main difference of this competition versus others is an opportunity for financing. We connect uh, venture capitalists, uh, private equity managers, uh, fund managers, as well as uh, angel investors to participate as judges in the competition. They uh, look at various aspects of the business. In fact, uh, many of our contestants get financed by the uh, investors who participated as judge. Uh, a case in example is our 2010 comp uh, competition winner got a million dollar financing from one of the judge. They raised a total of two and a half million dollar financing, but million dollar of that came from the judge of the competition. It also provides an opportunity to pitch in front of people who would ultimately be uh, funding you and gives you a tremendous experience in pitching. Uh, Unlike most other competitions, we have designed the competition to go in multiple stages. The purpose is to help polish your business ideas. As you interact with the mentors, and as you present and get feedback from the judges, the idea improves. You know what, where are the strengths, you know where are the weaknesses, and you research and work more on weaknesses. We have seen sometimes the 
project concept also undergoes a change. Your marketing market segment or the niche undergoes a change. And that's the reason we have designed competition to go through project profile stage. Then everybody goes through an elevator pitch, followed by a written business plan, again a presentation. So there are five different stages of the competition. And along with all the stages, we have constant feedback as well as mentoring. So what are the prizes? Uh, well, uh, first and foremost, the prize is an opportunity to win a million dollar of financing. And these financing come from the VCs who are acting as judges in the competition. We have already got commitment from many VCs to look at seriously and do due diligence on the top teams at the end of the competition. In addition, we have $150,000 of prizes, half of which is cash, another half is in various types of uh, in-kind services. We have special prizes for a certain categories. About, uh, we, have a, we have a prize for all student team. Uh, students of universities or colleges can participate in the competition and they get a separate prize. We also have a prize for uh, best intellectual property and that attracts a lot of university faculties who are looking to commercialize their ideas and they already have a patent or a patent application. We also have prizes in clean tech area and healthcare area. So these are some special prizes. Uh, In-kind services include services at Mars. Uh, there are lots of premium services which Mars provides to the winners of the competition. In addition, we have services from accounting firms, law firms, corporate finance firms, patent advisory firms, and others to help you participate in the competition. Uh, as I mentioned before, we get about 200 contestants, and the contestants come from a very uh, wide uh, uh, area of expertise. There are, on one extreme, student entrepreneurs who have never done anything on their own, and they do have an innovative concept, an idea, and they want to participate in the competition, and we guide them, help them in a number of ways. Uh, on the other extreme, we get uh, serial entrepreneurs. Uh, last year, we had about one-third of the participants in the competition were students, two-thirds were non-students. Uh, also, we had about a dozen serial entrepreneurs who had sold their businesses and are uh, looking, to, uh, looking to start something on their own, others. So we get patent holders, patent applicants, a number of things. The, the competition uh, attracts contestants from all kind of industries. Uh, we have a very wide variety. IT services still probably are one of the large uh, entries, but others like lifestyle, telecom, clean tech, and others are coming. Uh, we do have uh, many very qualified contestants, PhDs and engineers and MBAs participating in the competition uh, throughout. It is a North American competition, uh, uh, even though vast majority of the contestants are GTA, but we do attract contestants from other provinces and other states throughout. We have about 25 success stories. These are some of the names here. These companies have all raised financing, some as much as five, six million dollars. They were all acquired customers. They were many of them pre-revenue companies. They had no customers. They've acquired customers and have also uh, signed various types of strategic agreements. Most of them were just two or three partners initially, and now they have many employees. We're very proud to say that in recent months, we have had two exits. Cognovision was acquired for $25 million by Intel Corporation recently. Ecologics Engineering, which was the winner of our 2007 competition, uh, they were acquired by a New York Stock Exchange company for $8 million plus an earn out. So we're very happy and proud of their achievement. There are, uh, uh, we, our website is www.tyquest.org. Uh, I'll encourage you to uh, look at that. We have a flyer outside, a small little bookmark, and when you're going out, you are welcome to pick up a copy of the flyer. And if you have any question, you're welcome to send us an email. All the details are on this flyer. And look forward to your participation. Thank you. Okay, so that gives you a flavor of the big league uh, biz plan competitions. Um, uh, I will say I'm delighted that there were 38 attendees at the uh, workshop series that uh, was put on for potential upstart entrance. Uh, so I suspect we're gonna have a pretty good competition this year.
I'm also delighted to say that um, the speaker for next week, Arshia Tabrizi, who's going to be talking about intellectual property, uh, has agreed to donate $5,000 worth of legal services uh, to the winner of the Upstart competition. So think about doing this in series, win the Upstart and use your 5K when you win the TyQuest competition to negotiate with those VCs. It all fits together nicely. So, also, if you're planning on entering any of these competitions, or if you're in general planning on succeeding in business, you're going to need to listen to tonight's speaker. Um, tonight's speaker is someone that I listen to carefully. Kerry Golden is someone that I have worked with for over 10 years now. Uh, Kerry got an HBA from Ivy at Western and earned a CA um, at KPMG. And you know, I'm a chemist. And Chemists and CAs are kind of oil and water, but um, I have learned to listen to Kerry. Kerry uh, worked in a number of industry sectors. He was a pioneer in wireless communications, holding finance positions, obviously with Rogers Wireless, uh, CEO of Bell Mobility uh, Paging and VP Finance for Bell Mobility. But um, she's also worked as a CFO with Alliance Atlantis, um, you know, in the entertainment space, and with Loris Therapeutics. So one difference between chemists and CAs is key, CAs can do all sorts of things. Chemists can only do chemistry. Um, I worked with Kerry uh, in a venture fund uh, doing early stage seed investing. And Kerry bought many, many skills to our investee companies, but I think one great contribution was helping them understand how to manage their money, how to build a financial plan, how to manage cash flow. Uh, and um, that's something that, that uh, I gained uh, experience in, in in working with Carrie. She's currently a consultant to a number of startups, to a number of venture funds, and we're fortunate that she's spending time here at Mars working with us uh, on a variety of projects, including initiatives in the social entrepreneurship area. So I think the title of uh, Carrie's t uh, talk is Financial Planning, and we were joking, it's not only financial planning on how to make your money, but if you succeed, I'm going to ask Carrie for help on retirement financial planning. So without further ado, Carrie, over to you. Thanks, Tony. And I'm not qualified to tell you about retirement planning, so I'll, I'll let you find someone else to talk about that topic. I'm actually going to introduce you to a model that, that's not mine, so I want to attribute it to Alex Osterwalder, um, who creates a fairly simple business model canvas that just makes it easy to kind of understand things, and we will flow that into the financial model. And so just to quickly say, I mean, you've had a couple of lectures so far that have probably talked about some of these things, that obviously you need to identify your customer segments and those relationships you have, and you know, really clearly work on what your value proposition is to those customers. You need to understand what key activities you need to do in your business, like whether that be develop software or deliver a social service, what your resources are, what those assets are. They might be your people, they may be your intellectual property. Um, and who are the partners that are going to help you succeed in your business? And all of those things kind of come together in what I call the financial plan, which comes into two buckets. So you have your revenue streams, or think about it, the cash coming into your business, and you have the cost structure, which is usually obviously the, the costs or the, the outflows going out of your business. And I'll apologize in advance for my, uh, my voice. I have what I call the Mars cold, and it doesn't seem to leave you even after three or four weeks. So before you start building your plan, you're going to need the following. So you need to understand your business model. So you know, back to that canvas. Um, and you probably also want to understand what benchmarks you might have from other similar business models. Um, you also need to know what assumptions you're going to use in your revenue streams. So you know, what, what price are you going to charge? You know, how many of a unit are you going to sell? Um, is there information from a market intelligence perspective? I think Usha spoke to the class a couple of weeks ago about market intelligence that might be able to give you some perspective on the industry. Can you scope out what some competitors might be doing in your marketplace? 
you also then need to flip over and look at the costs and say, well, what resources? How am I gonna compensate those people? How are those resources gonna be used in my business? What are those activities actually gonna cost? Um, and also for your partnerships, I mean, there's some partnerships where, you know, they might be fairly loose and you may not have to pay a lot for them, but typically, you know, distribution partnerships or, or partnerships they're going to add, you know, the distribution reach for your business are going to cost you something and you need to figure out, you know, what, what that cost revenue sharing model is going to be with those, those partners. So I'm going to start with a little story. Um, that I found on the internet a couple of years ago. And so Sally, she gets this great idea, and she does manage to get some funding, let's say, from some friends and family. Unfortunately, Sally spends 100% of her money developing her idea. She runs out of cash, she's bankrupt. And unfortunately, that is the sad and very common ending to many of the entrepreneurial dreams we see. So what went wrong for her? She spent all pretty much of her money developing her product or service, and almost no time or money selling or marketing her product to potential customers. Like many entrepreneurs, she assumed that I build the greatest thing, the customers will come. And um, you know that everyone would be very impressed with what she'd done. She didn't use her funding well to achieve milestones that would need, she would need to get other investors perhaps interested in her business. You know, they're, all investors are always looking for companies that have some indication that the market or the customers are going to buy their product or service. And that's so true in regular times, but even more true in the, you know, the tougher economic times, which we still continue to live in. But I think lastly, and probably most importantly, is she's taken away the opportunity to lower her startup's dependence on outside financing by getting those early sales and becoming less dependent on other people for her success and more successful herself. And so with that in mind, let's talk a little bit about how to build a financial plan. So from a technical perspective, an income statement, you know, outlining obviously your revenue and your costs, et cetera, I always tell people you should build three scenarios. So build the one that you think is the most realistic for your business, but it's also a good idea to take a look at if things go really, really well, what kind of money am I going to need to build and support that plan? But if things don't go so well, and I have a few bumps along the road, which has certainly been you know, my experience over the last 15 years with entrepreneurial companies, you know, what does that plan look like? Um, it'll help you and your investors potentially determine you know, how much revenue you need to get to a profit in the business, you know, when you're going to break even, and pro you know, become profitable potentially. You also should look at what changes in that model have the greatest impact on probability of, probability of profitability, break-even, and timing. The balance sheet you know, is, I would say, a more technical accountant's tool. You definitely need it if you're going to look for some outside investment or you're going to seek a loan from a bank. Um, and it measures your key assets and liabilities. If you're not planning to go those sources, you might be able to avoid doing one in the short term. The cash flow forecast to me is one of the most important um, documents you can have in your business. You need to build it based on your, your business model and your plan to execute. And it's really about how much funding you're going to need over the period of time that you build your business. And what will you be able to accomplish it with it? So the income statement should come from a bottoms up view of what customer relationships are uh, that you may have or expect to have correlated with outside market data. Obviously, your pricing and cost assumptions. Social entrepreneurs, which I assume there are some in the crowd, should consider sponsorship contributions or donations as well. And I always say you need to consider the pros and cons of a hockey stick. And so what I mean by a hockey stick is many um, studies of early stage companies will say that you know I'm going to have a fairly flat ramp of my revenues, and then I'm going to sit, hit some inflection point it's going to look like the end of a hockey stick where revenues are really going to skyrocket. And so the, the negative part of the hockey stick is, you know, people may not believe that it's achievable um, by a startup or by um, the amount of investment you're proposing. The flip side to that, though, is that most investors, and I mean venture capital investors, really want to back hockey stick 
forecasting businesses because they're really looking for big, huge wins. And so, so you have to balance off you know, your credibility with your optimism for you know, how big a play you actually have. From an expense perspective, you also want to look at it from the bottoms up. Look at benchmarks for your industry if you can. Um, you know, ideally, try to identify which costs are fixed, so I have to pay rent every month, versus what are variable. So it might be a commission I pay on revenue, it might be you know, labor that I bring in and out depending on the volume of calls that I'm receiving, um, and, and identify those items. For social businesses, I think it's really important to take into consideration what the unique costs of delivering your social impact are. And if you can quantify those separately, and I use the example of, say, a cafe that um, employs disabled people where you know, maybe they're not as reliable at getting into work um, because they, they have a disability to contend with and you, know, you need to have you know, extra staff on hand that you can call on short notice, you might need extra management talent. If you can quantify that cost, you might be able to find a sponsor who's obviously very interested in that cause or your mission to pay that cost and then you're running the rest of your business as, af as if it is just a regular operation. And, and so I think that's you know, something that social entrepreneurs should think about. EBITDA is a technical term. It stands for earnings before income, taxes, depreciation, and amortization. And it really is the operating income of the business. And it's the, it's the number that most people pay attention to if you're looking at venture capital firms, private equity firms, analysts that are studying public companies, that's where they, they look to sort of measure performances of industries. So that's, that's an important number for you to know about um, and know what your EBITDA is. So the slide's, a, excuse me, a little bit busy. Um, but what I wanted you to encourage you to do is to go out and look at some benchmarks. So I went out and I said, okay, I'm gonna have a sample company up here that's in the online business. And so I gathered some data from Yahoo Finance. And so there are obviously some big players we all know in this space like Google and AOL, um, but I tried to find also some smaller companies, even though they're publicly traded. So you can see answers.com at the end here has only about $21 million of revenue. Because obviously as a small company, it's gonna be pretty hard for you to mirror the performance of Google right out of the gate. And so I've highlighted in yellow the line items that relate more to startups. And there are some things that, you know, once you become a big company and you get into non-recurring charges and you're making acquisitions, that I'm not really going to focus on. And so what I've tried to do is come up with a, a benchmark of what the gross margin is for those companies, what the EBITDA margin looks like, you know, what the percent of their R&D spending is versus their selling general and administrative expenses. It just gives you an idea. Now, the interesting thing about online businesses, they are a much newer category and we see quite a bit of variation if you look in the gross margin results. So it ranges from 34 to 100%. And that's because they probably don't yet have accounting rules that are making them as consistent on whether they put the costs in cost of revenue before you calculate gross margin, or they're including them probably in SG&A. And so you, know, you, you wanna look, and so you may wanna adjust things for outliers. So there's a couple of companies that have negative EBITDA, you know, the, the high one you might wanna throw out, but at least it gives you an idea of when you're starting, you know, what your financial plan might look like for your business. I wanna talk a little bit about the wrong way to forecast revenue. And so lots of entrepreneurs like to come and say, you know, I only need to go grab 1% of this really huge market and I'm going to be really successful. So this particular entrepreneur who did come through our doors here said to me, you know, it's a $3 billion market and, you know, I can get 30 million in sales by year five. The challenge with this is that, you know, it obviously doesn't look like your company is really making a, an impact in this industry. So you're much better off to target a sub-segment where your product or service is really gonna win the marketplace, um, you'll create a much more realistic and executable business plan for your small business. But investors like to back winners. So we like to see somebody who says, I'm gonna go out and I'm gonna build the greatest widget or I'm gonna deliver the best service possible and take you know, 15 or 25 or 30% of the market. I'd much rather back that team that's got that ambition than the team that says, I only need 1% to be successful. So how to do it right is to do a bottoms up version of it. And so in this case, this company had a distribution channel for its product through doctors. 
They had a realistic plan to recruit doctors as follows, 150 of them in year one, and trade shows and cold calling, and they actually had 60 of them already signed up by the time they came to visit me. And so they had you know, planned on 2,400 doctors by year five of the plan, serving 30,000 patients. Their pricing was $1,000 per year over the time of the plan. It started at $1,200, but they did expect some competition would enter and the price would go down. And so, and then they also identified that to cover those 2,400 doctors, they would need to put six people throughout North America to service those doctors, to you know, come by, educate them on the product, you know, stock them, restock them, et cetera. And so this is a much better way to get to $30 million that I, as an investor, or you, you know, yourselves, can get your head around how to execute. And so here's a little simpler income statement. So this is for my startup, and it, it starts in Q1, in year one. And I start with four people, and I, I build to seven. The first couple of quarters, I'm building my online presence. I don't have any revenues. I start to earn some subscription revenue, um, starting in Q3 and Q4. And you know, obviously, I have a loss that I need to fund in my first year of operation of about $360,000. So the revenue, other revenue forecasting considerations are businesses might have more than one distribution channel. So I might sell my product directly to you, but I also may engage partners to sell my product to you, particularly in remote parts of the world. And so you need to be aware of the fact that the end user selling price might be different than the wholesale price that you'd sell to a distributor. Also need to know too what the practices are in your industry. So in the tech industry particularly, I don't think I've seen anyone ever pay a list price. People publish them. Uh, but there's always some sort of a discounting structure that is out there that you need to understand. Currency, obviously, most companies from Canada sell their product in US and other markets. And so you need to have a pricing strategy for your markets. You also need to take into consideration volatility. And so I always give startups the advice that, you know, to be conservative. So I tend to use a lower exchange rate on my revenues and a higher one in any costs I have in dollars that are outside of Canada. And, and that generally gives me a little bit of a hedge that if it, you know, there is a currency risk that I still might be able to meet my plan. There's also, in a lot of technology and other businesses, the opportunity to earn professional services revenue by consulting or implementation support. And you, you need to realize that over time, obviously because those things are based on consulting rates that you're paying also staff to deliver, that you know, they need to increase over time and, and how you manage that. So once you've built your revenue plan, you know, I always ask, stand back, and is it realistic? And so you can see here at and Dilbert, you know, there's some pretty big things that are going to have to happen for this company to be successful. And, and my example here is I, I did see a company about three years ago that came in with a plan that started off with $25,000 in year one, and by year four was selling a trillion dollars. <laughs> and the costs to deliver a trillion dollars were only a couple of million dollars a year, which was great, <laughs> um, you know, if, if that could be true. But, I mean, we all know that, you know, we saw Google's numbers a few minutes ago. They're not doing a trillion dollars. So the likelihood of you getting there, I think, is, is not high. So cost of revenue is those costs that are directly related to earning your revenue. And so the term gross margin is really your revenues less your cost of revenue. And the types of things that go in there are for products, the material, the labor, the warehousing, the shipping, the warranty, everything related to it. For online businesses, they could be hosting connectivity, you know, cost to buy content, software licenses you need to operate your site. For services, obviously headcount and costs related to service delivery. These costs will change over time. And so volume often impacts what the variable cost items are. Um, product companies also often plan for engineered cost reductions. So if you're a startup, you want to get your product out and in the market as fast as you possibly can, get feedback from customers. Um, and those first few units might cost you a lot to make. But when you're producing them in volume or you, you make plans to change the product and, and you know, consolidate certain components that over time, it's good to build those cost reductions right into the plan that you're developing. Because that, that shows to investors you know, that there is this opportunity for, for greater margins down the road. Um, labor costs obviously increase over time, but there, sh there should be some offsetting productivity gains as you get volume. It gets expressed in terms of both dollars and as a margin typically. 
you should try to understand the targets for your industry or sector, and I've put a few rules of thumb up there. Software businesses tend to be much higher in margin, 80-90%, product companies 45 to 60, service companies 35 to 50, as we saw in the online one, a pretty big range. So um, really try to understand what yours, what yours is. The next line I'm going to talk about is development costs. And typically when I speak to a large group of technology-oriented entrepreneurs, they tend to be most comfortable with this cost. Um, the typical large component is the, the development team, uh, the labor associated with those, but you should really think about how that team changes. So at the beginning, you know, you have someone architecting your product and designing it, you get into development. As you become a much larger organization and you have a lot of customers, a lot more focus goes on to testing and quality assurance to ensure that you know, you're obviously putting out a product um, that customers will be, will be happy with. Um, it should address you know, future sustaining work on your product line, so you can't kind of assume I develop product one today and then I'm not going to need to spend any more on it after year one. Um, obviously the costs of patenting or protecting your trade secrets go into this, any outside licensing costs you need. And the one thing I really do want to focus your attention on is we have some really great tax credits and grants available to us as citizens of Ontario and Canada. And, and some of the ones you might know are obviously the scientific research and development tax credits that are geared more to technology companies, um, which the Ontario Innovation Tax Credit is the Ontario equivalent of. But there's also something called the Interactive Digital Media Tax Credits. So if, you're, if you um, have a business that entertains informs um, or educates a consumer, um, you can apply for those tax credits and they work similar to shreds. They actually are a little bit more um, uh, open in that, for example, if you develop a great game here in Ontario and you want some help, sales and marketing costs will be included, whereas in the, the traditional shred grants, that type of expense wouldn't necessarily be eligible. And then we have the NRC and IRAP programs that also provide R&D funding. But selling expenses often drive growth. And so here's a hockey stick. And so Newbridge is a company that was founded by Terry Matthews, one of our very successful entrepreneurs here in Canada. So if Sally, from my earlier example, had been Terry Matthews, she would have spent 50% of her expenses on sales and marketing in the year one, and only 33% on product development to generate some pretty spectacular growth from 1.3 million to almost $400 million of revenue in a reasonably short period of time. Newbridge isn't the only one that does this. So if you look at some very traditional technology companies, Cisco, Adobe, F5, you know, they're all spending significantly more on sales and marketing their products than developing it. Now that may not be true just in year one, but certainly by the time you get to year three, four or five of your plan, you should be thinking about those types of expenses. So what goes into sales and marketing? I mean, it's largely the labor costs of your sales, marketing, and customer service teams. You know, you've got to remember some of them might be geographically remote because you need to be close to your customer. Their commissions, marketing costs like PR and advertising, websites, lead generation, travel, living, and entertainment. Um, and I always advise startups, particularly if you haven't had a lot of experience in managing a sales team, that over time you need to have performance metrics so that the cost of pursuing a customer doesn't exceed the margin you make on that customer. So in the early days, it's all about getting those first five or 10 customers and everyone, you know, everyone's all hands deck on the company, spending the money, flying to the customers, getting the deals. But once you get past that stage, you really want to sit back and look, does it make sense? Because there's some business you may just not want to take because it's just too expensive for you to support it over the long run. GNA, labor costs obviously for operations, customer support, finance, HR, IT. Usually the CEO of the company fills in this category. Billing costs, so if you're an online business and you know, you're, you're collecting your, your fees from your customer base, things like PayPal and Moneris. Your rent and all the related costs associated with running your office, recruiting, which can be quite significant as you build a really large international team in a business. Um, professional fees, your board, some other miscellaneous stuff. 
So the balance sheet I won't spend a lot of time on, and I've just really highlighted a few lines. So these are the same companies we looked at before for income statements with the data from Yahoo Finance. It's a little bit less relevant for benchmarking because these, these have huge balance sheets, these companies, obviously, and you know, can take on significant debt. You might want to look, though, at something called days sales and accounts receivable. So that's kind of how fast people collect their revenue or the days that they pay out their suppliers and accounts payable. And so those, be those benchmarks might be relevant for you. And so here's my sample startup. And you can see things are a little simpler here. Um, you know, we obviously have some receivables. We have some other liabilities. And you'll notice in the HST line on my, uh, which is just the second line under liabilities and equity there, that it's negative for the first couple of years and then it's, it's positive. And that's because we also have the great um, pleasure of living in a country where when we pay our harmonized sales tax as a business, we get it back. And so you really want to sign up for that and, and get, that, get that back in the early days when you're not generating a positive return. Obviously, once you start to sell product and have to collect the HST on it, you net those credits you get against costs against the amount, and then you're, you're obviously in a paying position. So just quickly, um, accounts receivable, obviously, is the amounts owed to you by customers, partners, you know, tax credits, et cetera. As the business grows, you know, it might be a great thing, but you may also have to finance that growth um, because customers might not pay you right away. They may, may you know, have terms that say, we're only gonna pay you 30 to 60 days after you send an invoice. Um, inventory and prepaid expenses. So if you're a product business, you obviously have to think about how you build, man uh, build and manage your inventory. Um, and some expenses you have to pay in advance, things like insurance or a trade show, et cetera, and that's what a prepaid expense is. Some businesses are very capital intensive and, and need um, a lot of equipment to run their business, and we expense those over time. On the liability side, accounts payable needs to reflect the terms that you can negotiate with your supplier. And you should try to negotiate those based on your business cycle so it minimizes your cash flow impact. Um, and other liabilities could include things like leases or sales tax. Debt financing, um, a bank loan for a startup usually comes with a personal guarantee from the owner. Um, and there is a small business loan program available here in Canada that you can get through any of the, the large banks um, that secures the equipment and uh, makes financing available to you. Operating line of credit usually doesn't come to later on when you've got sales and inventory and, and you might be able to finance those. Same with long-term equipment loans. So if you're in the clean tech business and you do a proof of concept, but you need to build a big plant, you know, you would probably be able to find a long-term lender, assuming they, built, they bought into your business plan to finance that. And equity financing is essentially the money you receive from selling either common or preferred shares in your business. Cash flow forecast, key tool. So cash is, I'm sure if any of you are running businesses right now, you know king in startups. You need to monitor it frequently, whether that be daily, weekly, hourly in some cases. Um, and I think understanding and managing cash flow is key to any business's success. So you need to figure out you know, how much total funding your business needs and will require over its life. You need to think about what's the logical timing and available sources to you to get that funding. You know, whether that be from friends and family starting off or perhaps angel investors or eventually VCs or banks. Um, and you need to ensure that you get enough to show momentum to go into your next required investment if you're going to need more money than that initial um, raise that you do. You know, based on the above, you know, what's the round size? You know, how much can you invest yourself? You know, how much can you get from your network of investors? You know, develop forecasts for time horizons that make sense. And you know, for investors, usually monthly for the first year and quarterly thereafter works for them. So this is the manager's view of a cash flow statement. And I'm gonna show you in a minute what the public company or the accountant's view looks like because it's a little bit different. But I think this is a little easier to understand for the non-accountant, which is my cash inflows. Obviously, I'm getting $250,000 that I nicely raised for my friends and family to start my business. I've got some grants and tax credits coming in for $5,000 in that first quarter. And then I'm sending out my payroll and any other upfront expenses like rent. You know, I'm going to make payments that are due on to my AP suppliers. I'm going to pay, I'm going to receive my, um, I'm going to pay my HST and I'll get it back. You can see the next quarter when I file my, my return and so on throughout the year. So in this case, you know, over the life of my business, I've raised money twice 
for five hundred thousand dollars, and I've I've spent um, the rest, and I've ca you know obviously collected some cash from my customers. Just so you have it for reference, this is what it looks like typically when you'd see it in financial statements for uh, that are published, and so it really talks about what's your cash flow from operation, adding back any non-cash expenses working capital, investment, and financing. So it's just a different way to present the information. Um, you know, it's certainly, for early stage investors, very indifferent on form, but they'll just want to ensure that you are tracking cash flow in some way. Every year, I've done this lecture now for five years, actually, and every year I get these same three questions. <laughs> and so I thought, rather than wait till Q&A, I'd actually throw a slide up and give you some references on, on the answers. And so a lot of times when you're starting out, you, know, you don't have the money to pay your staff. And so how do you account for sweat equity for those people who are giving their time and either being paid below market wages or being paid nothing to get start off? You know, how much equity and stock options should I give? I generally tell you to keep things simple, and so definitely you need to record the number of shares you give out in your share register, but I wouldn't worry so much about trying to record the value of that on your, your balance sheet and, and your financial statements. At the early stage, it's very difficult to equate dollar for dollar, because you know, you, there is an upside potential that people have from owning the equity in your business, and so if your business is worth $100,000 and you're trying to recruit an executive who used to earn $200,000, Quite frankly, they're going to own your company in a very short order of time if you agree to go dollar for dollar. And so you need to come to a reasonable agreement with people. Um, so we have an article on the Mars website that I'll, I'll, I'll leave up there, and I know the slides will be posted, that sort of talks a little bit about how you might allocate stock options um, and or that initial capital to the people in your business. I get the question as well, what's the difference between sweat equity and stock options? And the difference really is equity, you issue the shares today. So, you know, I, I'm starting the business, you know, you see me as a partner in the business, you give me 100 shares and they're my shares and, you know, eventually, hopefully they're worth a lot of money when I sell my company to Google down the road. Um, whereas an option is really something that will happen in the future. So you say to them, I'd like you to participate in the equity in my company and, you know, for let's say two, five, ten, a dollar per share, for this next period of time, you know, you'll be able to buy those shares you know, at any time you want. Although the concept you can use in options is vesting. And vesting is an important concept in that you know, oftentimes everyone comes in with the great intention that we're all gonna work really hard, we're all gonna be here for the next four or five years and work really hard to make this startup a success. The reality is, though, somebody might not like it and decide they need to go find a job or do something else, and they might leave. And so if you give them all their options up front, and they're not there to deliver that you know, sort of longer-term value, you might not want them. So typically, options will invest over a three- or four-year period of time, and there's usually a drop-off at the beginning, and it might be anywhere from six months to a year, where, you know, so you don't have to worry about those people who might only be here for a couple of months getting vested options. And then the last one is, shouldn't the value of developing my product or service show up as an asset on my balance sheet? Like, how do I convince investors that this is worth a lot when, you know, you saw that income statement where I lost $360,000? In Canada, actually, either approach is fine, but it's much simpler just to expend them. And investors really don't care. I mean, they can figure it out. They, they can figure out from your income statement how much time and effort you know, you've spent an external money in building your business. And so it's, it's kind of a, you know, an unnecessary thing for you to take it to that next step. And I always believe early, keep it simple as much as you can. Some final thoughts, just business model gets quantified in your financial model. Um, they should be consistent. Um, so you shouldn't say, you know, I'm selling in my marketing plan for $200 per service, and then in your financial plan have it at 50. Um, those are the types of things that are going to tip off investors or bankers that you, know, you may not have as credible a plan. They need to be well researched and thought through before you start your model. That said, it can always be a work in progress. So there's going to be certain elements of a plan that you have a lot more confidence in, probably around the initial costs, than necessarily there's your certainty around what your revenues are going to look like. And so it's okay to be honest about where you're really confident and where you know, and that's where it comes back to those three scenarios where 
you know, if this happens, revenues will look like this. If Y happens, revenues will look differently. Um, it, you know, it's a much better way to approach this from an investment perspective. Monitoring your plan, uh, monitoring your progress against the plan is absolutely as important as developing the plan in the first place. And I think in today's times, it's so important to develop a plan that gets you to early revenue and early cash flow as soon as possible. Um, and the last thing I'll leave you with is we do have some good um, references on the Entrepreneur's Toolkit. So some workbooks on developing a financing strategy for your company and on the business plan, which has some, some elements of the financial plan in it and the executive summary, and some articles around raising money, developing your financing roadmap, what's an execution plan, how much money should I raise, how do you engage with investors, and for those of you that are building social businesses, whether they be social inter enterprises that are nonprofits or social purpose businesses for profits, we have a couple of articles talking about some of the differences there. So I'll actually have a couple of minutes left, so I'll tell you a story, and it's a challenge to each of you. Five years ago, I met a very interesting entrepreneur here at Entrepreneurship 101, um, and his name is Haroon Mirza, and he was the founder of Cognivision. And as you saw from our TieQuest presenter, Haroon sold his company to Intel. And I had the great pleasure of mentoring him through that process over the summer. And you know, he, he took everything in like a sponge and you know, came out with a really great outcome for him and his team who are part of the Intel Capital team here in Toronto now and will be building a division around their technology. And so I'd love to meet one of you tonight. That's going to be my Haroon in three or four years. So thanks very much and I'm happy to take your questions. Like, um, what, what is uh, more important for the um, startup company, making a profit or solvency? <laughs> Hopefully they're the same thing. And solvency is, I mean, in a startup, cash flow is more important than accounting profit. There's just no doubt about it. Um, and so, um, absolutely, that's the answer. <laughs> uh, hi, Terry. Jason Hurlbut, nice to see you again. Nice to see you. Um, I've got a, two questions. One is around, uh, you mentioned uh, investors, you mentioned patents mm -hmm. in, your, in your talk there, and I've heard two stories now. One yep. is, what have you got patented in your intellectual property? And the other is, we don't care. What's the barrier to entry? Mm -hmm. uh, what's your experience with the potential investors regarding that point lately? And there, it's both. I mean, there are some investors who really have an interest and investing in companies with deep intellectual property, which involves patents. Um, and there are some funds, I, I have an investor actually in my uh, startup that I work at part-time, that's called the Northwater Intellectual Property Fund. So you can tell they definitely were pretty keen on doing some IP due diligence on our company and ensuring that we have a strategy to be patents. If you're in a space like an online business, it's really about execution and creating those barriers to entry. Um, and, and there really won't be those same kinds of questions. Um, around your business. So I think it really depends. I mean, certainly if you're doing, you know, a pharmaceutical, a new drug, you know, they're going to want to know that if we're going to invest a hundred million bucks that we're going to have some protection over the next <laughs> 10 years for it. So I think it really depends. I do think a lot of the business models we see at Mars today, the, it's, it's less important. Absolutely. Well, thanks for that. My second question is, is around, uh, do you have any tools uh, around the impact of investments in what happens to the share price, the dilution, that type of thing that you can easily do some what-if scenarios with? It's a good question. We do have, um, you know, certainly you can chat with me offline and I, I'm happy to prepare to do something. I, I don't recall on the toolkit whether we do have any, I, I think we do have an article, but I don't think I've, I've referenced it here. Uh, but I can, if you, I'll get, I can send you an email just telling you where it is. Because yes, I mean, one thing, um, and, and today's topic isn't, isn't financing, and I think we do have a lecture that talks about the terms and things coming up later on. But I mean, it can look on the surface that someone gives you a great valuation, but sometimes the devil's in the details. And so um, knowing what all those terms and conditions mean and what that impacts on what you know, founders will receive from proceeds is, is really important. Um, to look at as well. Thanks, I'll check up with you. All right. Thank you for your presentation. I You're wonder welcome. if you could talk a little bit about uh, the early stage versus the um, later stage of investment and 
when the investor comes to you, he's looking, you're probably going to hone in on your, clash, your cash flow statement immediately to see what kind yeah. of cash flow. And I wonder if you could talk about just the net present value and how that connects with the cash flow. The net present value, I would say, doesn't really come into the discussion until later stage. And so when you look at a net present value of a future stream of cash flow, it's obviously a methodology you can use for valuation. And, and it certainly you know, can be used on, on more mature businesses that are you know, generating you know, some historical results that you could have some confidence in. And so they're really trying to assess, I think, a, you know, from an angel perspective, two or three things. One, do they believe in you as the entrepreneur? Two, do you have a reasonable plan? And so they don't want to give you a check today for your cash flow statement that you're going to run out of money six weeks from now. And they're going to be back, you're going to be back asking them for more money. So they want to see a reasonable plan, but they also want to see a reasonable amount of runway to achieve that. And then they want to get some idea, you know, and they'll probably gauge this with themselves or their due diligence network, because typically angels will invest in things they know or people they know. And so they'll, they'll try to get some read on, you know, is this a product or service that people would buy? You know, is the price seem reasonable? You know, does the amount of cost that the person has in their cash flow statement, you know, reasonably get the person to a point where they can be generating revenue? And those would be the types of things they'd be looking for.